People say, isn't Bitcoin digital gold? If Bitcoin is digital gold, then is gold physical Bitcoin? Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, January 3rd at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, January 3rd, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified on new updates, and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. We truly do appreciate your support. E.B. Tucker is our guest today. E.B. Tucker is an independent director of Metalla Royalty and Streaming. He's also the author of Why Gold, Why Now? An Essential Primer to the World of Gold and Mineral Royalties. E.B. held analyst and editor positions at several of the world's largest paid financial newsletters, including Casey Research and Stansberry Research. We're delighted to have him here with us today as a first-time guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for E.B. Tucker. E.B., welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Glad you had some some time to, to share with us. Uh, can we start with an, an introduction? Can you share with us your background and your journey into the world of gold and silver, which you refer to as the golden path? Yeah, it's it's you've got a copy of my book there, and I've got uh, a picture of it back here behind me. Uh, the the beginning of the book, you know, I, I, as you know, I tell this story of of kind of why should you pay attention to the book? You know, I mean, I think as a as a as an author, you've got to earn the reader's time. Time's the most valuable thing we have. So why should I spend it reading something? And I explain how you know I wasn't born into a family that liked gold. I mean, my grandfather was in banking and he thought gold was interesting, but not really worth, you know, owning. Uh, my dad told me stories about the 70s and the gold stocks went up and then they crashed and you don't want to be part of that. So, I mean, I didn't have any background. Um, and then in about 2001 or so, I started to get interested in gold and it wasn't a smooth journey. I mean, I was a, a blogger. I was writing blogs, going to conferences, calling companies. You know, and then I, I managed money with another guy that was about my age. We, we put together the most comprehensive research possible on small mining stocks. And, you know, people, they're not that excited about that. So we really just worked. It was a project in futility, right? And, uh, you know, but all that knowledge took me then to the newsletter business. And I wrote some of the world's largest newsletters for about a decade. Um, and, and now today, you know, I sit on the board of two of the fastest growing royalty companies out there, Metalla Royalty for gold and silver and Nova Royalty for copper and nickel, which those need to be separate. You know, royalty companies that mix everything together don't tend to perform as well as those that keep it separate. So it's 2020 now for a few more days and we're almost to the turn of the year. And uh, here I sit, you know, I've got the, the book on gold, which with the feedback I've had is that it's one of the easiest to read books on gold out there. And Metalla is, is one of the best performing royalty stocks and Nova, you know, as well, the copper nickel play. So I tell everyone in the book, this is what I've done, you know, and, and I give you the whole path, right? It's not just like a one big success story. I mean, you know, there's lots of pitfalls along the way. And every single one of those, something happened. I turned some corner, uh, some dark alley, but then boom, next thing you know, you, you learn something important, you know, that, that takes you down a different path. And so I think it's important people, people see that that's, that I call it the golden path because everything has worked out just fine. But um, I didn't have any idea it would go like this 20 years ago. You got, got to ask, we'll back up a bit. Um, your blog and, and all of these things you had going on. But you never bought your first ounce of gold until four years after learning about gold. What, why the little bit of a gap? Yeah, I almost bought uh, and I was talked out of it. You know, I was probably t uh, 22 or something when gold was like in the high 200s U.S. dollars an ounce. You know, and that was like the real bottom. And I called uh, a company, you know, that, that I, we didn't really, I didn't really have, I, I grew up in the American South. We didn't really have the internet for a long time. I mean, you know, it's like, 
And then we're like, nobody's going to use that thing. I mean, you don't want to. Anyway, so you still watch TV back then. I remember we got a number on TV. I called and they said, you know, you can get this ounce of gold for uh, 275 plus shipping and everything. And I remember telling, you know, people that I respected and they said, well, that's so dumb. I mean, what are you going to do with that? You, then you got to have a, a box with a key and you got to keep it in there. And OK, so I didn't do it. And then one of my really good friends who's still one of my dearest friends uh, in my life today he was buying uh, coins, uh, St. Gaudens coins at a coin dealer in Connecticut. And he was taking some of his weekly paycheck and buying a coin a week for about $400. Um, and his premise was that, you know, these coins will have collectible value again someday. And so he started showing me all the coins and I just caught the bug for it. Right. I mean, I thought, man, these coins are great. You know, like, a, like a, they're so cool and they're so old and, you know, so much history. And, and so that's what got me going. And you're right. It was a four year. I mean, I, I, gold went from 275 to roughly 400, maybe 450 or something. So I, you know, but the lesson for people there is, is that you didn't miss out. I mean, it's, it's 1875 right now. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's like, you, you don't, you know, say you have to get the lowest price in the whole world possible. I mean, it's not like that. I mean, we are in a time where gold prices are going much, much higher because every single problem in the whole world is solved with more money. I mean, it's, it's almost the equivalent of, of every body ache, you know, you, you, you take a powerful painkiller. My, my finger hurts, take a painkiller. I mean, I have a headache, take a painkiller. Well, what happens? I mean, you're a junkie. You know, at some point people say, I hate to be the one to tell you this, man, but you're a junkie. You, you can't solve every problem with a painkiller. You can't solve every problem that comes up with more money. It's not possible. I mean, and we all know this. And so the gold price is very managed. People ask me all the time, is it manipulated? I don't want to use that word. Let's call it the market is managed. There are bullion desks. You can watch them overnight. In the U.S., it's morning for you. Overnight here, this, the price goes whoosh, straight down on a rope. And then there'll be a news announcement and straight back up on a rope. Who can sustain themselves in that? Any person that's a novice futures trader is toast when that happens. Okay, So the gold market, I'm watching it all the time. It's very volatile. It, it, the, in the short term, it, it, it runs in these, in these crazy up and down cycles. People can't hold on to it. And that's huge profit if you're a big trader. So I'll call it managed, not manipulated. But people need to see that's all short term. That's like me missing 275 to 400. It's irrelevant. You know, now's the time to protect some of your wealth and gold. The book is titled The War Against Your Wealth and How to Win It. Yeah. That's what we're really doing here. You know, and 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 the gold price is gonna is gonna go much higher. And um I think the way to make money off that is owning the royalties, but I mean, you got to start with having some physical metal. That's the, that's the starting point. Okay, yeah. We'll get into the, the royalties in, in a bit. So you wrote the book, why gold, why now the war against your wealth and, and how to win it. You wrote this book in a fast 23, three days. What do you mean specifically when you say that your book is a self-defense book? So, so the, it's a great point. I, 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 23 days, it's true. I wrote 2,000 words a day for 23 days and came up with 50,000 total words. You know, some days were longer than others. But what I felt like people needed at the time, because everybody was calling me, friends, what's happening? What is this virus? What are we doing? The whole economy shut down. You know, there's no traffic. There's no airplanes. There's nothing's going on. And, and, and what do I do? My 401ks, they had all these questions. And I said, well, what you're really asking me is all this effort for 30 years of working and it's under attack. And what are you going to do? You know, you're going to wait for your, your congressman to pass a law to help you or something. I mean, it's just crazy. You know, it's you're on your own. No one's going to come to your rescue. I mean, that's what capitalism really is, is that, you know, no one comes to rescue you. Now, what we know nowadays, and I talk about in the book, is that the U.S. is not really capitalist anymore okay because some people get a bailout some people don't some junk bonds get bought by the fed some don't 
So that's not capitalism. Capitalism is the market forces decide who wins and loses. And, and, and we don't have that anymore. And so your wealth is under attack. If you've been uh, spending less than you earn, investing the difference wisely for all these years, that's building wealth. That's what you were told, you know, pay off your debts, save, buy some stock, do all this. This is the net result of your whole life, okay? And in a moment, it's being whipsawed down and up and the currency's being changed and the laws are being changed and the debt's ballooning and it's going to balloon more and the interest rates are negative and the inflation rates higher than they say and all of this stuff is stripping away real value of your life's work. And I think people need to see that. It's not a conspiracy theory. The Fed is telling you that it wants 2% inflation, which means four. <laughs> so, so then they're telling you, please buy these bonds, you know, these, these 10 year bonds for, for less than 1%. So you're, it's negative interest rates. You're going backwards. You, we're going to give you less than 1% and take away four. Yeah. Come on. That, that's the telling you what they're doing. You're just not listening. So I think when you explain it to people in the sense of what have you been doing all your life, flying coach instead of business class, saving and saving for your kids and, and paying off your debts, you're trying to build wealth and it's under attack. That's the premise. So yeah, you said something interesting where the U.S. is no longer um, it's no longer capitalism in the U.S. What would you then call it right now where we are, and just how bad is it? I mean, what do you see happening down the road with all this money printing going on? Well, the it's two separate pieces that you've got there because one one piece is when you decide who wins and who loses, it's definitely not capitalism; it's state controlled. Uh, it's a state controlled economy. And what I like to call it is a crisis economy because you go, you go from boom, 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 crash, boom, 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 crash. How do you, how do you play that? I mean, I mean, it's not, you can study, you could study all you want. I mean, I was with, I say this in the book in January, I was at the home of, of one of the world's foremost thinkers, you know, in, in the advisory business, he advises most of the world's major hedge funds. We didn't have any idea that six weeks later, the entire economy would be shut down almost overnight and the major markets would lose a third of their value. Now, interestingly, the gold and silver market, if you remember, at the end of February took a serious dive. And, and, and I think that was sniffing out the, the gold and silver market oftentimes sniffs out the what's coming in the major market. But, but that's state controlled capitalism. That's, that's not a market based system. And so you have to say to yourself, well, am I going to go out and take maximum risk if my competitor over here might get better terms than me? I mean, that sounds Soviet. It's like, I mean, if you're close to the people in power, then you have a business. And if you aren't, then you don't. I mean, what, do you, what is that? Anywhere else you would call that, you know, a, a controlled system with a Politburo. But in the U.S., we still line up, you know, to, to be excited and wave the flag and eat hot dogs and watch NASCAR and vote and do all these things, you know. And, and you know what I say to people? I say it's it's nice to be taken in by dogma because it's easier in life because then you don't really see what's happening. And so I watch people standing up to salute the flag. And I just think maybe that's a better way to live because if you really see what's going on, the whole thing, you know, it, there's, there is a ruse. And, and once you see that there's no going back and maybe it's better to not even see it and just continue uh, walking along the road to serfdom, as they used to call it. Yeah. Is it then a foregone conclusion that saving in fiat currencies is a surefire way to, to lose your purchasing power and it's only going to get worse with continued currency debasement with central banks printing money? Well, let's put it like this. If, the, if you can't find a better investment than losing 3% a year, 
maybe currencies are a good place to invest <laughs> because you know if, you, if all the other options are going to go down 20 then maybe cash is good for you now and i'm and i'm halfway being serious about that because some people say well why would you keep you know you always say keep cash around to take advantage of dips and people say i can't keep the cash around cuz i'm losing money yeah but i mean if the market dives 30% in 3 weeks because of a virus and you're you've been losing 3% a year you can take that money and put it to work. So it's really hard. You know, you can't, you can't say, I got to get out of cash completely because uh, then you're, you're tied up and you can't take advantage. I mean, silver went to what, 11? If you didn't have any money, you couldn't take advantage of it. So it's really, it's tough. I mean, these are not things that you would expect in a market-based system, but this is what we're dealing with now. In your book, you also had a chapter dedicated to the 1933 gold confiscation by FDR. How likely could we see a gold confiscation event by a government today, given that astronomical debt that we do have and the bleak prospects of currencies? Well, that I think that's chapter four. It's probably my favorite chapter because my grandfather was my my mentor in life and taught me, you know, all about banking and all about stocks, and 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 we were very close and. Uh, his mother gathered everybody in the living room and had a cigar box filled with gold coins from the 19th century. And she let each kid keep one. She had four kids. So you could keep five ounces of gold. I, I think it's about five ounces of gold you could keep legally. And then you had to turn the rest in. And I show the, I tell people that story because it's a true story. And my granddad always told it to me with lots of color. And he, he loved his, his mother and thought, you know, she was, very wise. But I thought she sold out. Why didn't she keep the gold? But he explained to me that he said, you don't understand. The newspaper every single day was editorials about traders have gold. Uh, treasonous people have gold. Uh, people that want to see there was a drumbeat. Gold is against the US. If you had gold, you're against the US. You're a mercenary. You're not, you know, you're you're going against Roosevelt. You're I mean, so my granddad said, listen, imagine this is your newspaper. You didn't have a television. It's a newspaper every single day. The front page is how gold is so terrible. What do you and then they threaten you 10 years in jail or ten thousand dollar fine if you don't turn in and what are you going to do? You have to be you have to be a real cowboy to keep the gold. And you also have to be uh kind of detached from society where you, you know, you wouldn't, you couldn't have gold for what, 39 years after that. Yeah. That's a while. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you're 30 years old, you're, you're 69 when, when you can have gold again, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you could barely get around maybe. So, okay. I tell that story so people can see that now. Do you, do I think gold's going to get confiscated this time? Well, one thing you need to consider is gold is very unpopular. Crypto is a lot more popular than gold. And if you don't believe me, then go to a dinner party with, if you can't really go to one right now because you have to wear a dental shield and a plastic suit. But if you were together with friends having an illegal dinner gathering, uh, ask them, you know, what are their thoughts on gold? And they, ah, you know, it's cool. It's, you know, I don't want to own it, though, whatever. What are your thoughts on crypto? Oh, my friend just bought this, you know, they'll tell you all about it. So gold is going to have to get a lot more popular. The price is going to have to go a lot higher and it's going to have to reignite itself as a wealth storage that that's broadly accepted. And then I think you can get into a confiscation event, which will be um, more of a, an excise tax, like a, a tax on sale. Okay. That would be, that would be because the what they're doing right now is they're controlling the financial system to the point where you have a really hard time moving around any money of serious value. I mean, you guys probably know you wire in a million dollars over there. Like, where'd this come from? You know, it's, they, they, they all these forms and FinCEN and everything. So so that's we already know that. So, I mean, imagine gold's, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars an ounce and, and you, you want to sell 10 ounces of 70 grand and, and you got to all this has got to go through the system. I mean, you could trade it to someone, but this is a real hassle. So, so that's probably how it goes this time. But let's just remember at higher prices and with much broader distribution. So you've written about why gold got to ask, do you feel the same for silver? Why silver? 
Yeah. So, so I try to tell people the first thing you have to do is understand the gold story. You got to get the, the, the math and the algebra behind the gold thing right before you go into silver. Because as you and I both know, silver is a, is a great trading vehicle. Uh, it goes on wild runs. I actually think that this coming year, you know, it, it'll top 40 bucks. And, and I don't think that's the, the end of the run, but I don't want to tell you what I see next. Let's let it hit 40 and then I'll come back with you. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I see after that. But but silver is going to take off, and it's going to catch people by surprise. Now, silver has some of the properties of gold. It, it's been money before. Um, you know, it has it has some of the staying power of gold. It's a precious metal for sure. Uh, but it has an industrial side. Now, what makes it a crazy trading vehicle is that not very much silver production is primary. That means that a lot of the, the silver production comes as a byproduct of lead or zinc or some other material. So if you want to turn up the, the supply of silver, you can't easily do it. See, gold, gold is stored all over the world in vaults and, and in, you know, under the, the, the bed of Indian housewife. And I mean, it's all over the place. It's people, they hold on to it, right? But silver is different. I mean, when you make a solar panel, that silver's in use. An ounce of silver is now out in the desert in a solar panel. Uh, so, you know, so so silver is different. If the price starts rising, it's very difficult to bring new supply onto the market. So my advice to people is get the gold story right. Understand gold. Understand what you need to own because that's wealth preservation, wealth storage. It's easy to store a lot of wealth in a small space with gold, then get the silver story and decide how you want to own silver for bigger moves. And silver might be one that you buy, take the move and sell. I mean, I personally have derivative trade on silver right now, you know, going out 18 months, laddered out. And, and I think I'll do very well with it. Um, time will tell, but that's a profit oriented trade. Whereas the the gold, physical gold trade is more of like a, your balance sheet. I mean, you're stabilizing your wealth. It's wealth insurance. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you touched on solar panels. How big of an impact do you see the growth of the renewable energy market having on silver? Well, before I tell you that, let me just say, um, I've been deeply into this market for the last two years because we started a royalty company called Nova Royalty to, that focuses on copper and nickel. The ticker on that's NOVR. So I've had like a huge education on the amount of metal demand. And what's occurred to me is that is that I don't know how they're going to find enough metal to be able to make what Joe Biden says is going to happen happen. <laughs> so that's, you know, it's copper and it's nickel, but it's also yeah. silver. I mean, there's silver and all this stuff. And and we're not going back to coal power. We're not going back to even to, to gas turbine uh, development. You know, nuclear's having a run right now, but it's to be determined if people... See, everybody thinks the solar panel is is, is peace, peace and love, you know. They, they don't, they think nuclear is dangerous. But when they see solar panel, they think this is groovy. And they don't realize that to, to get enough silver to power the world on, on solar, you're talking about a serious high price in silver to go out and find new supplies. So, I mean, that's a huge piece of demand. Whereas uh, jewelry, um, uh, photography is very low, you know, the, the fillings you don't get in silver anymore. Okay, all these things have come down. And the and the green energy demand is more than replacing it, and so that's that's what people need to see. With with nickel, it's the same. Stainless steel demand is about flat, you know, but the battery demand is growing at tremendous numbers, and it's it's the same thing for silver. Yeah, I was going to ask you uh, when you mentioned copper and nickel, how are you seeing nickel right now? The demand has really been going up since uh, nickel is one of the key components in electric vehicle batteries. It is. And there's 45 to 50 kilograms of nickel in the average, you know, midsize electric vehicle. Uh, people ask me all the time, well, won't there be a, a new battery technology? Yes, but probably not for some time. And you're talking about billions in CapEx uh, to build the 811 
nickel battery. So these companies, Panasonic, Tesla, all these big companies, they're not developing that to then change it to redox flow battery or vanadium next year. Nickel is in high demand. Uh, there's problems with supply. You know, half of it comes from Russia, a quarter of it comes from Indonesia. Then you've got laterite nickel and sulfide nickel. You know, one of them works for batteries. One doesn't work as well for batteries. People don't know any of this stuff. There's not a good nickel futures market. It's a small market. It trades in a very lumpy fashion. So if you want to speculate in nickel, what do you do? I mean, do you buy BHP, which does mine quite a bit of nickel, but also mines, you know, tons of iron ore and coal and all these different things? No, it's too, it doesn't make any sense. So that's why we started Nova, because a royalty company, this is very important, a royalty company that's focused on one specific metal. Like when I say one metal, like gold and silver counts to me as one, it's precious. Copper and nickel, you know, it, 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 we count that as one. But when you focus on one type of metal, you give share buyers a chance to speculate on higher prices in that metal without worrying about operational risk. Okay, so Nova Royalties got 17 royalties now, copper and nickel royalties. You know, they have a pipeline of deals we're trying to get done. What, what does the future hold? Time will tell. But the, the game plan is, you know, we got up to 17, keep, keep going. All right. You start locking in 30 to 50 years of nickel supply. Now, yeah. gold mines can be short. You can do a three-year gold mine. Nickel and copper mines are the size of a downtown of a city. I mean, you're talking about half a century. I mean, fly into Salt Lake City in the U.S. and fly over Bingham Canyon, which you can see from outer space, by the way. That's been going for 100 years. So copper and nickel mines are fewer in number. They're massive capex. They go on for a long time. So 17 royalties. I've got years and years of mine supply. And then you take nickel from $750 to $10. And what's the value of 50 years of nickel production at you know 35% increase in price? Huge. So a royalty company gives uh, investors, if a royalty company is well-managed, if they focus on one type of metal, if they're disciplined with their share structure, they give uh, investors a chance to speculate on that rising metal price without worrying about uh, uh, aboriginal issues, yeah. uh, financing markets, uh, you know, all these shipping tariffs, uh, you know, trade wars. That's different. That's that's for the mining company. And so I think now is the time where investors that are on the cutting edge, you know, you know the guys that are really focused uh, and and know what's coming, they see the chart of Rio. Tinto and the copper miners, you know, first quantum. Okay. And they say something's happening, you know, and something's happening here. And, and I, I need to, I need to take exposure now. Yeah. Great points that, uh, when you mentioned 811, I, I think we're talking, uh, the batteries are eight parts, nickel, one part lithium, one part cobalt. That's right. And they used to be four for the nickel part. So they right. doubled, you know, so yeah, you're exactly right. Okay. Um, how about the gold and silver mining sector? How, how are they doing right now? Well, it's, it's a tough business. I mean, in the book, I, I call it affectionately the worst business in the world. I mean, I, I came out of the, the fund management sector where I traveled around the world, went to mines, went underground, you know, wrote reports on them, and it just is really hard. I mean, you always need more money. You, 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 you're tied to capital markets. You're tied to investor sentiment. You're, you're, you, you've there's just so many problems. And I explain some of these problems in the book with actual stories of on the ground, you know, trips to places where you're just scratching your head, like, why did anybody buy the stock? It's crazy. I mean, there's thousands of little mining stocks that get flushed out in every, you know, down cycle. So I think it's a hard business, but 2013, 14, 15, 16 was very hard. And then 17, 18, 19 didn't really get any better. And so mining companies like Barrick, if you look, Mark Bristow is a very interesting guy. I promise you there'll be books written about this guy and classes taught about this guy. 
I have heard firsthand from people that work for Barrick what they think of this guy. They say, worked there 30 years, first time the CEO ever came to XYZ country and met with me in person and said, here's the, the plan is. And they're looking at him like this, okay? And he says, no, we're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. And you look at what he did. He acquired rivals. He consolidated operations. He, he uh, streamlined the business. He lowered the, the all-in production costs per ounce. He generates tons of profit. He's raising the dividend. Warren Buffett buys the stock. Okay, this is the market leader. This is your, this is your market leader has set the tone. And you don't see him saying, I'm going to spend a billion dollars to go look for gold on Mars. You see him saying, I'm going to run this business as if we can't count on booming gold prices because we can't. That's the discipline you see when you're coming out of a downturn. So mining stocks, when gold moves, they're going to go on a tremendous run. And Godspeed, if you are going to take that run with him because it's a hard business. And this is a guy that's been in it for a long, long time telling you that the royalty business to me is much more appealing. There's almost, you know, tell the story of Franco Nevada. You know, it's a billion market cap per employee. I mean, they have 26 employees. You know, it's, it's a totally different business. You have upside exposure. You know, you have non-dilutable rights to the mineral property and you have a free carried interest in, in greater discoveries. You have all those things in a royalty company. And, and so I think people need to really understand that. Now, part three of the book, as you know, explains that in easy terms. It's like, I tell you exactly why I helped start Metalla, why I helped start Nova, you know, why those are very big investments for me. You can look up the insider buying activity because I'm on the board of both. I have to file that. And you can see how much stock I've bought. And, and then you can read the book and see why I've bought it. You know, so so it's, I think it's important for people to see that now before the move goes. Otherwise, you'll get sucked into the mining stocks. You get somebody, they're gonna, these guys are going to find the next big discovery. Maybe, but it's a big risk. Do you want to take that big of a risk? I mean, maybe, but with how much money? A little bit of money. And people make a mistake. They use all their money. Okay, so for, for investors pretty new to the precious metals equities, uh, how can they get started? Should they focus more on the majors or steer clear of the juniors? Well, the first thing they can do is read the book because the book is very cheap and, and, and easy to consume and it could save you a fortune. Okay, so once you've done that and you want to get exposure, you start with bullion. So the number one thing you do is you start with bullion. Now, the question is how much bullion? Probably less than you think. You know, so I mean, if you if you you look at a small percentage of your wealth, you know, two, three, four percent, whatever you want, five. I mean, you know, okay, that's enough to start. That's enough. You know, you can make a pie chart. Look at it on a pie chart. You know, you don't need. It's like you don't need uh, 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 ten health insurance policies. I mean, you know, you just need some health insurance and you're good. You know, so but with gold, people go crazy. You know, they go, oh, I need fifty percent of my net worth in this thing. I mean, maybe that's too much. I don't. I don't know. I don't want to say that because for silver bullion. The company, it could be good, but I mean, people need to, to understand, look at this thing from the big picture perspective. So you start with physical gold. Until you've held an ounce of gold in your hand, you're not ready to go forward. Okay, so you got to do that. Now, maybe gold's too much. Okay, start with silver. It'll accomplish the same purpose. The problem is if you're worth millions of dollars, you try to put 5% of your net worth in silver and you're going to have to rent a, a, a warehouse. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult. I mean, you guys will do it for me. But I mean, the point is, is that like, it's not practical at a certain level, whereas gold becomes much more practical. Okay. So then you go from there to maybe some, some third party storage. Okay. So that, that, then you can go with your third party storage and you can go with physical demand ETFs that, that will back the holding and go, then you can go with big mining stocks. You know, like I talk in the book about Ignico Eagle, Kirkland Lake, Alamos, Pan American Silver, Barrick, Newmont. And people say, well, these are too boring. Oh, yeah, 30, 40 percent in a year. That's boring with dividends going up, free cash flow going up, operation expenses going down. Do that you call that boring? I mean, you know, it's like show me show me what you call exciting. So so 
you start with those. Then you can you can say, do I want to go with the juniors or do I want to go with royalty companies? Now, personally, I like royalty companies because this gives you more exposure to upside without the risk. The, the numbers in the junior game are really tough. I mean, you have a lot of failure. There's a lot of problems. And, and so I think you go, you go to royalty companies. And, and so that's the way you look at it. And so when you make your pie chart, you know, and you have your other things in your life, you have real estate and art and, you know, rugs and S and P stocks and, you know, whatever you got life insurance. And then you got your gold as a piece of it. And that's how you break it up. You're an independent director of Metallo Royalty and Streaming. Can you help us understand how a royalty and streaming company works in the precious metals mining sector and why should investors consider such companies? All right. So first thing is Metal is different. Okay. So we don't finance mining. Everybody thinks that a royalty company finances mine operations. Maybe some do. We don't. Okay. What we do is we buy uh, third-party royalties that are existing in the market already. And that means the guy found the mine in 1992 and sold it to the big company. And we go to him and say, why don't you sell it to us for stock? And, you know, and then you'll own part of Metalla and Metalla will get bigger and you'll, you'll be, you'll diversify your, you have one royalty. It's not worth that much. You diversify it and it's worth a lot more. So what that guy knows and what our investors hopefully know if they've looked at our slide presentation is that a royalty company needs to have diversification with where the assets are i mean you can't have all your assets in tanzania and no assets anywhere else that doesn't make any sense <clears throat> you can't get sidetracked with other metals you have to stay focused on certain types of metals and then you need to stay in a certain size range you can't do 50 royalties for 5 million and then one for 500 million because then then you have too much risk. And so what investors get when they buy a focused company like Metalla is they get upside to the rising gold price. They they get away from dilution. So so it's non-dilutable free carried economic interest in a mineral asset. Non-dilutive free carried interest in an, in a mineral asset. Okay. So that means if the mining company finds more gold, you get 1% of that. If the mining company goes bust, you wait for the next mining company and your royalty claim is on the land. It's on the mineral rights and not on the actual company. And so we, we want to make bets on assets that are going to get developed by Pan American, Ignico, uh, Newmont, Barrick. I mean, these type Kirkland Lake, I mean, you see in our presentation that we don't want to make bets on ABC junior mining company that might find the mother load, but also might go bankrupt. And then, you know, nobody will buy that. And you sit there for 20 years waiting. We don't want to do that. So Mattel has got uh, something over 60 royalty assets. Now it's very hard for me to keep up because they've done, you know, 19, 20 deals, you know, and it's, it's the pace is very good. It's four years old. The stock started at a dollar 20. It's about, um, 1470 today, Canadian, you know, and, and so, uh, before the coronavirus, it paid a monthly dividend, you know, so, I mean, a lot of mines closed down and took a break, you know, so, so the cash flow paused, but the value of the company stayed because your royalty doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't wither. And so people need to see that that's very different from digging ounce out of the ground and making a profit. It's a very different business. Okay, hey, last question. What's your outlook on precious metals for 2021? Uh, I thought you were going to ask me about Bitcoin, but because <laughs> everyone wants to know about Bitcoin. But uh, okay, for 2021, uh, I see gold 2,500, silver 40. And I think it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen during the year. I mean, we, we thought that would happen by the end of this year, but we, we, we missed. The, this was a serious decline in the fall. So you had gold going down while everything you looked around and saw would have told you the gold price was going higher. And then you watched the action in the market. You just had these straight down days. It was very strange. But I will tell you, silver has not made a new low since September. And yeah. so it's made higher lows. So $40 silver, $2,500 gold. And I'll, I'll give you a freebie on the Bitcoin piece because... <laughs> 
everybody asks you about this. In the book, I have a chapter about Bitcoin, as you know, which I think people should read because I have a theory about Bitcoin. But people say, isn't Bitcoin digital uh, gold, right? And I say, no. And then they argue. And I say, okay, wait a minute. Let's reverse that uh, statement. You know, If Bitcoin is, is, is digital gold, then is gold physical Bitcoin? No. Mm. <laughs> so, 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 so reverse, reverse the statement. And, and then at the end of it, this is what I think. Bitcoin probably goes much higher in price, but it's not the same thing as gold. And gold is not the same thing as Bitcoin and Bitcoin is not gold. It's two different things. And so when you get these people that get this confused, you're talking about an ideology. They're ideological. And you don't want to be that way about anything in life, not even gold, not even silver. There should be nothing in your life that you say, I'll never sell this and no one can talk me out of it. Because you always want to be as free thinking as possible in life. With everything that you do, you want to have no dogma, no beliefs that, that, that trap you into, into seeing, missing the view in life. And so when you get people are very argumentative about Bitcoin, you, you need to separate these two things. I mean, Bitcoin's market cap is, I don't know, 400 and something million, a billion, sorry, right now. You know, it's, it's a, gold is maybe 12 trillion. You know, so I mean, and there's 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 limited supply with Bitcoin. There's limited supply with gold. However, gold is is not physical Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is not digital gold. Okay, great point. I know you got to head out, but before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about your work? And do you have a website they can go to? Well, I I don't have anything to sell them or a website, which should be refreshing these days when it seems like everyone wants to sell you something. But I do have a book and you can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can listen to it on Audible. You can you can get it on Kindle. It's available in most of the world. It's Why Gold, Why Now by E.B. Tucker. It's, it's not expensive. It was written so that you could consume it and learn something. And I'm on the board of uh, Metal Royalty, MTA is the ticker in the U.S. and Canada. It's on the NYSC in the U.S. Uh, I would learn about that company. I'm on the board of Nova Royalty, Copper Nickel Royalty Company, uh, that's NOVR in Canada and soon to be listed on the NYS on the uh, OTC in the U.S. Sorry, uh, and and that's how people can keep up with me. I'm on LinkedIn, you know, and I keep people up to date on LinkedIn with with what I'm up to. And I'd love to come back and check in with you in a few months and see how things are going. That's great. We'd love to have you back again. Why gold? Why now? Any Second book coming? Why silver? Why now? People are asking about that. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see. I've, I've had a few good suggestions and, and uh, we'll, we'll see. If there's another economic shutdown, maybe it becomes a, a definitely a reality because once I get going on these things, I, it tends to go very quickly. All right, E.B. Tucker, we appreciate your time and you coming on the show and hope we can do this again soon and have a happy new year ahead. Thanks, you too. That was E.B. Tucker, author of Why Gold? Why Now? The war against your wealth and how to win it. For more information on Metella Royalty and streaming, please visit www.metelloroyalty.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. Do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.